You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds, with you live from Tasmania. Herds, we've just wrapped up the Terror Australis Readers and Writers Festival. Ten panels, a murder mystery dinner party uh, about a blue blue light disco, bunch of book signings. I think the blue light was the killer in the end. Oh, that sounds right to me. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I know it's been fantastic. I've loved get to do this. This is my first time emceeing a multi-day event. So it's been a wild ride learning lots of skills and meeting lots of wonderful people. And of course, talking about some fantastic books. Yeah. Someone really should have told us when they said to bring your favorite 80s detectives that the 1880s weren't a, a valid well, answer. I, I still think that Monsieur Lecoq, which is a great name for no particular reason, Monsieur Lecoq is the best <laughs> detective from the 1880s. But you know- we can fight about that. That's fine. We can have a debate here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I, I've I've had a fantastic time getting to see the interests of a lot of the authors that we've covered. Like, for example, you know, Ashley Collegian Blunt was on and we had her book Dark Mode on earlier this year. And I think there's a lot of stuff in there that kind of makes a bit more sense to me now that I know sort of how 80s pop culture inspired it was. Like even though this whole festival was very 80s themed and we were hosting it somewhat ironically, I don't think either of us is particularly deep in 80s crime culture. Maybe we need to have an 80s themed year. Do you think you could handle that much 80s nostalgia? Ooh, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to say no, but if you do have any 1980s crime fiction that you want to recommend to us. Or 1880s. Either way. We are live from Tasmania right now, but in case the connection wasn't working, we still did uh, record this episode on Anthony Horowitz's Moriarty Ahead. So uh, we're going to throw it over to past us and enjoy it. You're listening to Death of the Reader, and we are herds Mm. here with a novel by Anthony Horowitz. Again? At his own request. Oh. Moriarty. Is Horowitz the Moriarty of this show? Is it like, <laughs> I challenge you, Flex and or Herds, to solve my latest conundrum or they die. No, no. The, the audience, so, I assume. Anthony Horowitz, last time we spoke with him on the show, mm. after a discussion I had with him, suggested that we cover his book because of something interesting it did with its narrative that I can't tell you about, Herds, Uh because it might give the game away. But in 2014, this was one of two Sherlock Holmes continuation novels that Anthony Horowitz put out. And this one starts with both Moriarty and sort of Sherlock Holmes dead. So who instead does the story follow? Why, of course, it's Athelney Jones, famous goofball from The Sign of the Four, the last Sherlock Holmes novel that we covered on the show. I I bet you remember him so well, Herds. I I know. I definitely remember exactly who that character is. I've also definitely remembered the name of the character that's following him around. I'm excited. I love when, look, this is like my historical novels, except the history is the history of murder mystery. Yes. Which is always exciting because we're kind of dancing around these beautiful names that we know so much about. We can play at the fringes of something that's, you know, enshrined in golden age detective fiction canon Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is always fun. Yeah. So the setup for this novel is that one Frederick Chase, a chase, an investigator from the real true to life detective agency Pinkertons in the United States, who are a bunch of upstanding individuals upholding the values of freedom and justice and (laughs) all sorts of good stuff. He's been sent over to Europe to track down one man named Clarence Devereaux, who is a thorn in the side of Pinkerton's before the novel begins. And basically he had been sent to try and track down where Clarence Devereaux was hiding and figured his best shot was trying to get a letter that had been written to the late Professor Moriarty that he was alerted of by his uh, his understudy, Jonathan Pilgrim, who had gotten in with Devereaux's gang. Devereaux is basically the American Moriarty. That's something that this novel kind of plays with, is these parallels between the Sherlock Holmes stories and, and this novel, obviously. Like, Chase is kind of the Watson. He even spends an entire chapter telling us his backstory in the same way that Watson would perhaps tell the story of Sherlock Holmes. He doesn't necessarily just tell us his backstory. He tells Athelney Jones his backstory. Yeah, sure. And Jones is, in some ways, Sherlock, although in other ways he reflects Watson a little bit more closely in that he has, like, 
injuries that he may have sustained from some kind of fight or war, that sort of thing. And other characters show up that, of course, we're, we're familiar with, like, Strahd, and there's all these other police characters who have maybe my favorite conversation in the entire book, which I'm excited about. I need to be clear, I enjoyed it because I'm not a big superhero fan, like comic book fan, but the <laughs> conversation that the police have about Sherlock Holmes is kind of how people in comic books talk about when like Superman dies or Batman dies. And they're like, well, you know, he may have been doing all the work, but that just means it's time for us cops to shine. And maybe we are relying on them a little bit too much. So I, I really enjoy that angle that Horowitz is playing that this Sherlock Holmes really is like a figure of superhuman power in this universe. And they, they treat his death with the same reverence. Yeah. Also this idea that he plays with there where they observe that the methods that Sherlock Holmes uses in the books doesn't actually make that much sense. If you sit and think about it. Because it's fiction, right? And this is also going to tie into actually solving the quote mystery of the novel, even though I feel like this is a less straightforward murder mystery, but in, in solving the twists and turns, the fact that the final problem was a story that may have had some rewrites with the return of the character of Sherlock Holmes is part of this story's narrative. You know, we're told to question why all of that drama even happened in the first place. And I'm sure it'll all pay off swimmingly, you might say. Yeah, because Frederick Chase, who is our narrator in this story, has read uh, Dr. John Watson's accounts of what happened. And he is writing- Without solving any of them. <laughs> yes, he is, he is writing what we are reading after the return of Sherlock Holmes. Yes. And it, it's really interesting that we also set this up where Athel Lee Jones, who was a bit of a buffoon when he appeared in The Sign of the Four, has clearly gone about reinventing himself as Sherlock Holmes. Mm, yeah. And it's so much fun that the novel has that scene that you talk about there, Herds, where it questions- the nature of Holmes as a detective while we are following the Holmes and Watson of, you know, Sherlock Holmes knock off Athel Lee Jones and John Watson knock off Frederick Chase. They also have a really interesting discussion about Watson. He's not mentioned that many times compared to Holmes in the book, because of course he isn't. He's not the big name. He's, he's just the author. But when Jones first mentions, he says, you know, I met Sherlock and Sherlock was this way and that way. And he talks about all of this stuff to do with the the sign of the four and, and Holmes. And he says, oh yeah, Watson was also there. Um, didn't make much of an impression. And the, and the cops, they then when they get to the cops, they say, wow, that Watson really portrayed us in a poor light, didn't he? Not true to mm -hmm. life at all, which remains to be seen, of course. I did love the way that when, when I was reading that account of Athelney Jones at the start and he says, oh, you know, it was to deal with that incident from the sign of the four. And I was like, wait, this guy's from the sign of the four? I, be I barely remember him at all. <laughs> like, it's so interesting that the novel is like very engaged with that sort of portrayal of the police. It doesn't pull punches anywhere about the oddities of what's going on. The other one that I really enjoyed was the way that we engage with what Pinkerton's is and was, which is that like Frederick Chase, whenever he's recounting what Pinkerton's does, he's presenting their very anti-worker massacres to stop unions as like sympathetic because it's difficult to run a detective agency and he's not paid very well, but gosh, it's just because he doesn't work hard enough, you know? I'm only a third of the way through the book and I don't, I don't understand his full impression of the Pinkertons, but when he first talks about when he's trying to get a job at the Pinkertons, he thinks he's going to need a police experience. He's going to need a background in order to join the yeah, Pinkertons. Yeah, they're not just going to let anyone in exactly. here, are they? <laughs> they're not just going to let any old corrupt individual in who can swing a gun. And he even hears that they don't want people who are on the police force because the police force is rife with corruption. And exactly. that is such a brilliant line because it's both like, yeah, well, the police forces can be corrupt. So that like makes sense. But also the Pinkertons were awful, you know, union busting, putting down riots, you know, violent murder, you know. There's definitely a sense that because the American culture of the more brutal than Moriarty Clarence Devereaux has come over to London, 
that the sort of methodology of Pinkerton's is reflective of that. He says something along the lines of, he assured Athelney Jones that even though the agency had been accused of inciting riots and murdering strikers, it was only to protect property and to keep the peace. Yeah, it's for the greater good, you know? Yeah, there's just this acceptance coming from the American side of this story's narrative that has a very strong comparative tone to it, and it's kind of fun when we start seeing, like, the scale of what happens increase drastically. Like we begin our first like scene of the investigation. We meet with this young boy called Perry who goes to stab Frederick Chase. They follow him to this mansion, show up at the mansion the next day and they're like, where are you hiding the boy? And they say, we, we don't know anything about a boy. And then they show up to the mansion the next day and everyone is dead. Yeah. And that's because of the American villain Devereux, yes. of course. So the novel is drawing these lines between you know, this is what the British police will do and what the British criminals will do. They'll mostly go back and forth and yell at each other and do little play fights. But that's nothing compared to what Devereaux, the American crime boss, is going to do to protect themselves. Yeah, you could say there's almost that same fictional aspect to the way that Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes are portrayed compared to the like almost, I guess, realism of Clarence Devereaux and Pinkerton's. It's brutal, right? Like it's, there's no clean kills. It's blood everywhere and maids murdered and, you know, little kids apparently like threatening to stab people in public. It's much more brutal. And a lot of the stuff that would have happened off screen, I think in particular, the use of children is interesting because Sherlock Holmes is known for employing a small gang of orphans. That's yeah, just the, something that the he did. Yeah, the Baker irregulars. Yeah, the irregulars. And that's like a charming thing. You're like, oh, those, those poor Londoners hanging out with Holmes and he'll treat them right. But in this world, when the kids get involved, they try to murder people and they have no qualms about doing that. The cops even are like, if you'd asked me yesterday, could a child have killed all the people in this mansion? I would have said no. But today, after seeing Perry... Absolutely. That kid could have killed five people or whatever. And if only he had the strength to lift their bodies. There's a lot more on the table that Anthony Horowitz has put here by bringing in this outside force, bringing the brutal real world into the mythos of Sherlock Holmes. And there's something really fun about that. It's cool. It obviously aligns with Horowitz's intent to kind of peel back the mask of tea and cozy crime that's over a good Sherlock Holmes mystery and be like, these are the awful things that could have happened in those books and maybe did if Watson wasn't there to write over them, right? Yeah. When we spoke about The Sign of the Four, we commented a lot on how it was much more about the like adventurous spirit than necessarily the crime solving that was the appeal of the books. And, and it's interesting that Anthony Horowitz hasn't brought in more of the crime solving. He's brought in the like, well, this is how this would actually go if you were to try and get away with these silly hijinks. Yeah, if you were actually dealing with a criminal syndicate that's cross-continental, these are the sorts of things that these people would be willing to go to to protect their own interests and protect their own lives. It's a cool angle. I'm really terrified to see what awful ways that our main cast gets, you know, hurt. <laughs> that's that's probably where this is going. That's, uh, the, one of our main characters has a family. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the other thing that's sort of fun where the novel's gone as well is that because Athelney Jones is a Scotland Yard inspector, our main cast, as you insinuate there, is like constrained by the old world to some extent. They still have this, you know, chivalrous game going on where they're expecting the criminals to behave. So they just go in and like charge the nightclub that they know is supposedly run by this mastermind criminal. And like part of it's because they don't have enough evidence to go in the full hog. But after what we've seen in chapter seven, when they asked one question at a small mansion with seven people, the threat of them going into this nightclub is like, what well, the, mm, I, mm, I feel like there could be some consequences here, boys. Like they have a full on police raid, which is pretty intense. The bobbies go in and they start, I don't know if they beat anybody up, but they, they definitely shove people around and like shout at the barkeep. Lestrade gets a good go at it, which is, you know, it's an action scene, even if there's no like real violence on the part of the cops in that scene. And yeah, as you say, there's got to be a retaliation. The two brothers, the Mortlake brothers, the Dead Lake brothers. Oh, good God. <laughs> there's so many names in this book that I'm like, is this going to be a thing? Because his name is Chase because he's chasing the truth. Mortlake, is they going to find them dead in a lake? What's happening? It, I'm just saying. 
If every blasted name in this book is a clue, Horowitz, I'm suing you. It's happening. Um, it's, <laughs> anyway, I, look, yeah, they, they tell the Bobbies to shove off, although they do allow them to search through Pilgrim's room and, and find a vital clue, even though they thought they wouldn't find anything. So maybe, maybe that's a sign that even with all this violence, there is some worth to the, like, the gentleman's game. You know, there, there is value in it. So I'll be interested to see by the end of the book how awful things get. Like, you know, there's got to be an event horizon somewhere where we find out whether our Pinkerton is going to come out on top and be the guy to shoot everybody or if cooler Scotland Yard heads will prevail. I guess we'll see. All righty. Well, I suppose speaking of clues, herds, we should wrap this part of the discussion here and come back and talk about the various mysteries we've been posed with over the course of Anthony Horowitz's Moriarty, first nine chapters of that story. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. We'll be back in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Hertz here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are here discussing Anthony Horowitz's Moriarty. The second novel is in his Sherlock Holmes continuation series. First nine chapters of that and Herds. There have been many little mysteries uh, that have been solved. Too many. Yeah, I know. There's, there's been lots of mysteries that have been solved. There, there are several that are still on the table. But yeah, there's been a lot of little mysteries. I almost wonder if... Like, obviously, our show, we have a structure that we do. You know, we do three weeks. But if I were to read this with a group of people, large group, you do like one chapter a week and kind of try to solve all the individual mysteries because there are some that just, they happen, and then the chapter afterwards, they're solved. It's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it does give you this sort of opportunity where if you are engaged with the puzzle solving and you're presented with the cipher, at the start of the book and you want to sit down and try and solve it before the characters do, then you have the opportunity. And I think once you've kind of been presented with that first cipher, you're going to be like, okay, I see now that all of these are going to be solved individually. So I know to solve them as they appear rather than like giving it a little bit of time, but it does make for an interesting kind of challenge in pacing the book for yourself, where if you sit down and try and solve every little mystery, you really could kill the pacing of what is a rather fluid book, I think. I wonder, honestly, and obviously you're going to have a better idea of this than I am, like how much of these mysteries we're kind of expected to solve as we go. Because there, there are some mysteries, or well, there's at least one mystery that I feel like I, just by virtue of my own humor, I, I feel like I've already solved. But there are lots of mysteries, like the sniper that is mentioned in the first chapter, but I don't think it's shown up since. And like some aspects of Devereaux themselves and their identity that I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to be able to solve right now. I'm not sure, but there are lots of little mysteries that the characters are actively solving. The cipher and what's going on at the Bladstone house, like how they were able to break in. Although I kind of feel like they already solved that one. I'm not sure if that's a a mystery anymore. It's a bit weird because there's like a locked room. It's a locked house mystery. How do they get inside the house and everybody's dead? And like, I thought they'd already established that the small child was inside the house or anyway, it's, it's fine. There's lots of mysteries like that where they kind of seem to solve them and I'm not 100% certain if they are things that I'm supposed to kind of grapple with, with my innermost detective brain, or if I'm supposed to just sort of go, oh yeah, that is interesting, and then kind of move on. Well, I think, honestly, that is the most interesting part of the challenge about this book to me, is that there are so many very neatly tied threads at the end of very long ropes- (laughs) Okay. And it's really interesting to sit and think while you're reading this book, well, is that done or do I have to keep thinking about yeah. this? Like, it's, is yeah. the cipher over? Is there a second solution? Why was the cipher there? Does the letter mean something else? Is there a more obvious solution? Why would two dudes who are famous for working with an entourage use a ciphered letter to get in contact with each other rather than sending the mooks. Yeah, and then the meaning itself is a mook and the big man, which is also a, a weird imbalance of power, I get yeah. Like, obviously, there's characterization implied through that that, like, Moriarty's on the back foot because he's being hunted by Sherlock. So Devereaux is being more cautious in dealing with him. But then why meet with him at all, you know? And I guess that's, that's something that you can kind of draw some crazy theories out of, which I'm sure I can. <laughs> Yeah, and then there's also other stuff like the clue that you've just come across, Herds, which is 
they show in chapter eight when we're seeing the oh, aftermath yeah. of what happened at Bladeston or Bladeston or whatever 13. you say it house. Yeah, where it says Horner 13. Which is not really, well, it may not be a clue that I can solve because it's yeah. in the book, at least. So then in chapter nine, they raid the club and they find this hair tonic advertisement that says Horner and 13 on it. And even though that doesn't link up as cleanly as I would like to, like in my brain, I'm like, oh, it doesn't seem like it's 100% a one-to-one. Is that a reference to an old Sherlock Holmes novel? Is it a reference to something that you would know if you lived in the city of London? Is it like some something that is meant to be intentionally unsolvable and you're meant to read something from that? It's a great question. It's very difficult to identify what the actual puzzle you are meant to be solving in this book is, and not in the same way that Martin Edwards does when he says that sentence. Like, <laughs> it's, it's much more that there are so many tiny puzzles that whether you're going to end up solving this tiny puzzle into a bigger jigsaw piece that fits into a larger jigsaw is kind of beyond you as you're actually doing the moment to moment reading. It's interesting. I think that as I'm approaching the story, I'm more interested in solving like the bigger mysteries. There's some very clear mysteries set up in the opening prologue with the the death of Jonathan Pilgrim. Like why was he killed? Although that also seems to have been solved. Um, (laughs) To me, that's a bad example. More like the whole situation with how is Horowitz going to explain the Reichenbach Falls? This hair tonic business, like I'm looking at the clue and it's like five lines, five separate like indented sections of information. And it ends with 13 Chancery Lane, London, E1. And that could just be, you know, the address, but E1 could be like a chess thing. It could be like night to E1. Like, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure out if there's a chess reference in here. Although maybe I'm just a step away from genius. I don't even know. But yeah, there's lots of stuff like that, which is, which is fun. Can I tell you, though, because Please. there's a lot in this book that I'm kind of mulling around. The book obviously opens by saying that Sherlock Holmes was a master of disguise, which is not a thing you ever want to hear about your central protagonist or antagonist <laughs> in a murder mystery, because it means that there are characters who are actually other characters. However, I am going to go out on a limb. There is a really terrible thing that the characters do in order to trick Devereaux to, into thinking that Moriarty is still alive. And they mention that there's a chef who's gone missing around I the same time that, that Holmes and Moriarty did. And they say, oh, let's just pretend that that's Moriarty. I'm going to put my chips down. This is independent from any other theory I made today. I am so sure of this fact. I would stake my reputation on it. And it sounds like it's going to fall apart on you. No, this Franz Herzl character is 100% the corpse that they found at the bottom of the falls. 100,000%. There is no doubt in my mind because then Horowitz can get away with like not actually killing off Holmes or Moriarty. Like they can still be around to do stuff and Moriarty can probably be someone. And yeah, also it's just one of those bits. It's a, it's a great joke to be like, yeah, wouldn't it be funny if this character was actually the corpse? But the problem is why on earth would Moriarty want to fake their own death? because I assume that's what's going on here. Well, it's obviously just because of the dramatic parallel he, you know, precognizantly read in Dr. Watson's writings. Of course, obviously. But that's the thing, right, is that Watson's written an account, and I had to decide whether or not Watson is in on this bit or is acting independently, because the efficacy of his writing is many times brought into question, which is (laughs) beautiful. It means I had to decide whether Watson is secretly a criminal or something. Ooh. Well, we do know he's a military man, and we do have that mention of Colonel Sebastian Moran. It's true. It's true. Are they the same person? Are they the same person? I don't know. I'm just going to say it's very clear that Herds here has completely forgotten everything from the last time we covered what? Sherlock Holmes on the show. What do you mean? Sebastian Moran is just part of part of the Holmes canon, my friend. Oh, okay. Look, I don't remember that one character. How am I supposed That's to okay. remember? It's okay. Okay. I'll trust you on that one. Look. What I'm saying is, I'm going to go on a crazy limb here. I'm ready for it. And say that Moriarty has faked their own death because- Because. Because Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes are the same person. That's that's the big twist that we're going to get. That's the big That's one. the big twist that that's we're going to get. That's the big get. twist. That's the big twist. Because it's interesting. he realized that he couldn't continue this facade of continuing to run away from uh. himself forever. And that's why nobody ever sees him outside of that van or that carriage that he's in. So you are suggesting 
here in this novel where Anthony Horowitz has taken the swashbuckling nature of Sherlock Holmes and turned it on its head, mm. that he would also choose to turn on the story's head that Dr. Watson is now collaborating with Moriarty because Moriarty is Sherlock Holmes and that the account of what happened at Reichenbach Falls in the original novels was fabricated by Dr. Watson to set up this book by Anthony Horowitz two centuries later. <laughs> yeah. See, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say, look, that sounds great to me. Yep, that sounds good sounds to me. Good. I have only, no problems so with this. <laughs> the only problem with Watson, because as the much as I like, problem. the only problem, the only problem is because as much as I'd like to pin this all on Watson and say that they're a bad person, is that in their account, they mention a small Swiss boy, which I think you would want to erase all evidence of because we seem to be looking at that same boy in present tense, this Perry character. Oh, so you think it is, Perry was in- in Switzerland. Switzerland was the character who like drew Watson away in his account of the story. So unfortunately right. I don't know that I can argue that Watson is in fact evil because then Unless he'd be implicating you're his that own. Watson was working with Clarence Devereaux. Now that's possible. If it's Watson's plan to annihilate Moriarty, would put to hold on now. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't. Flakes, are you telling me that that theory doesn't make any sense at all? And you're just clowning. Hurts, if there's anyone I trust to make <laughs> this theory hold water, it is you. <laughs> just like that corpse. Just like the curse of Franz Herzl. You would waterboard yourself until suddenly the water <laughs> stuck. <laughs> Look. I like the idea that Watson is so incompetent at his job of writing murder mysteries. That is one of the rules. That is one, of the, one of the rules. The rules of murder That's one mystery. of the rules. Is that Watson is incompetent? <laughs> that he could not figure out that Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty were the same person. That's why Holmes is so afraid about those boulders in the Alps or whatever. When he goes, "Oh, I'm being killed," and everyone's like, "That doesn't make any sense." It's because he's secretly Moriarty, pretending to be attacked by Moriarty. Look. He's, he's plotting his own demise so he can get out of this life. And that's why there's only one set of footprints going up to the full. That's true. That's true. It's so he can get out of his deal with Devereaux that he's being forced into and he can live his life carefree some, somewhere else. And of course, that's why Perry is working with Devereaux because he was collaborating with the Baker Street Irregulars because he was working with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you know what? Sure. I don't know that we need that, but yeah, I, you know what? I'll believe it. It's just it's just all these neat little coincidences that just support your theory, Hurt. That's true. You know what? That's accurate. That's accurate. What if they're all the same character? What if we just make every character the same character? I feel like that, <laughs> what, that what holds the most every character water. just is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? <laughs> Wrapped up in a hat and a monocle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if Sir Arthur Conan Doyle just was Charles Dickens? Dude, Charles Dickens? if Charles Dickens was Edgar Allan Poe? And what if Edgar Allan Poe was Anthony Horowitz? Then I would have the greatest expectations of Anthony Horowitz's book, Moriarty, in stores now, <laughs> as of eight years ago. <laughs> oh, Herds, I love this theory. I really do. I really do quite thoroughly enjoy this theory. I have one question I want to I wanna ask you this week uh, for a free uh -oh. bonus point. Sure. I love bonus points. What is Devereaux's retaliation going to be? Murder the wife and child. Murder the wife and child. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's what I'd do. Okay. If I were an evil American mastermind and Jones had been talking about having Chase over to visit his family. Oh, you reckon we're not even going to get to meet the wife? You reckon she's just going to be dead when we get there? No, no. I think we're going to meet them. And then let's say two chapters later. Oh no, my wife and child have been kidnapped. That's what's going to be 100%. And they're not going to come back alive. What? Just to be clear. No, they'll be fine. Oh, they're going to be fine. I, I mean, I hope they'll be fine. I hope, I hope they're okay. Nice. Do I have to pick? Do I have to pick one? You do have to pick one for this bonus. <laughs> no. Point. I'm going to say that we get to rescue them. Whether or not Herds has secured that bonus point, you're going to have to wait and see. I guess we'll see my fate of a free point. I'm excited for it. Next week, we're going to be reading chapters 10 to 16 of Anthony Horowitz's Moriarty. As we continue on this Sherlock Holmes continuation novel, having a grand old time with the slightly gorier and less swashbuckling adventures that Anthony Horowitz has imagined for these characters, Athelney Jones and Frederick Chase. Also, Jones is Watson. Done. Jones is Watson. Final theory. Done. Easy. 
where the war injuries come from. Oh. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We have been live from Terra Australis Readers and Writers Festival here in Tasmania this week, live and pre-recorded. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I uh, had a great time. Definitely a, definitely a highlight of the weekend. <laughs> Such are the logistics of festival travel. As I said, our next stretch of chapters is 10 to 16 in Moriarty by Anthony Horowitz. We'll be at Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival next week. It's been a pleasure joining you. See you around.